One of the big items of tech news in the last year or two has been that Apple has started implementing their own silicon. Previously, all of Apple's computers, including the Mac series, all used processors that were not created by Apple. For example, the Apple II used the 6502. The first series of Macs used 68,000 chips from Motorola. Then they used PowerPC chips, also again from an alliance of other companies and Motorola. Then they jumped ship to Intel. For their mobile devices, they've been using chips designed by ARM and manufactured by third parties for them. But now, for their mobile devices and the Mac line of machines, Apple have started to design their own processors, having licensed just the ARM instruction set, rather than the hardware design. And there has been much fuss about it in the tech press. What the tech press has not mentioned, though, whilst claiming several times that this is the first time Apple's ever done anything like this, is that Apple has, well, done something like this before. Or at least they tried. Yep, it's time to talk about Project Aquarius. Before we get stuck into the details of this thing, just to avoid any confusion, this has absolutely nothing to do with the Mattel Aquarius. That's an entirely different machine that did not involve Apple in any way, shape or form. No, what Apple was going for was somewhat more technologically sophisticated than the Mattel Aquarius. Well, to be honest, almost everything's somewhat more technologically sophisticated than the Mattel Aquarius. I mean, the Albanian State Washing Machine Company is technologically more advanced than the Mattel Aquarius. Project Aquarius was there to create a new CPU for Apple. As why they were happily still designing machines around the 68,000, they knew the 68,000 roadmap was, well, coming to an end. And also, in the world of Unix workstations, there'd been a huge explosion of RISC processors. Practically every company that made a Unix workstation had created their own processor. Heck, even Acorn, the people who created the BBC Micro, they created themselves one heck of a RISC processor. So Apple kind of figured to itself, well, why the heck can't we do this if everybody else can? We're bigger. Surely we can manage this. Now, we all know in the end that Apple didn't use their own processor design. They went for the PowerPC, which might make you think that maybe they didn't try with this project. Maybe it was sort of like a half-hearted attempt, but absolutely not. Apple put some proper resource into this. By the time Apple decided to cancel Project Aquarius, they had 50 people working on this CPU. Now, that might not seem like a lot, but let's put that into context with other processors. That's one order of magnitude more people than, for example, Acorn had working on their ARM design. It's vastly more people than Sun had working on Spark. It's bigger than the entire research group that created Risk in the first place. Heck, it's more people than even the big bad corporate world of DEC had working on their Alpha processor. In short, this was not a half-hearted effort. Apple really did put some serious resource and money behind this. And so far, we've only talked about the staffing. There's a lot of other areas they spent money on in the CPU, which we're going to come on to later. But I just want you to keep in mind as we discuss this, that this isn't some little side project. Apple threw everything into this that they could do. Speaking of resources being thrown into stuff, this is the point where I mentioned this video is sponsored by PCBWay. Fine purveyor of printed circuit boards. And also pick and play services, CNC machining, 3D printing, there's quite a lot of things that they do. They have a website. You should probably go look at it. When Project Aquarius was first greenlit, it was a time of fairly significant change for Apple. Steve Jobs had just been pushed out, and John Scully had just become the CEO, with Jean-Louis Glacé being put in charge of the Mac product line. So those were the two people that Sam Holland needed to persuade that Apple could design its own processor and not only design the processor, but leapfrog both Intel and Motorola. Now, the initial idea Sam had for the design of the processor was that of a stack processor. And it's with this concept that he managed to get the project greenlit. Now, stack designs are a bit different to regular CPU designs in that there's no cache in this thing. What you have is, unsurprisingly, a stack. And values are either pushed onto the stack or popped from the stack back into memory. The processor itself doesn't have any instructions that does anything outside of the stack. Any values for any of the operands used in any of the instructions are from the stack. It doesn't directly go at a memory address, for example. But this means that software has to take care of loading any values that are going to be needed onto the stack and popping anything that needs to go back into memory from the stack. Now, there's a reason you haven't seen many hardware designs that work this way, and we'll come on to that in a second. Where you do see designs like this is in virtual computers. Things like the Java Virtual Machine, for example, where you have P-code or portable code. A lot of them do use a, essentially a stack design. Now, the reason why you don't see many of these in real hardware is 
It's an absolute nightmare for the people who are going to write the compiler. And that's what actually halted the idea of using the stack design in Project Aquarius. The team who was responsible for writing the compiler basically told them it was not a thing they were going to be able to do. A sentient compiler wasn't a thing that they were going to be able to create. So, unlike Intel when they were told that when they were designing Itanium, Holland and team decided that they would change how the processor was going to work rather than just try and force the compiler team to do the impossible. In fact, the only hardware implementation that readily springs to mind for me is that of the transputer. And with that particular design, they actually started with the language OCAM and then created the compiler and the instruction set for the CPU after that, and finally the CPU itself. Actually, the whole transputer thing is absolutely fascinating. At some point, I really should do a video about it. But anyway, we should keep talking about Apple. This is where the design switches from being a stack machine to a risk processor. And it's this proposed risk design is the one that we have all the details for. Because you may have noticed, there's not a lot of stuff out there about Project Aquarius. And there is a reason. Project Aquarius was supposed to be secret. Now, as you're about to hear, Apple had some problems with the secrecy of this project. And that's because it did some incredibly unsubtle things on Apple's campus. If you remember earlier, I mentioned just how much they were spending in terms of hiring people and having people work on the project and said they also spent some money on some other very significant resources as well. Well, it's now time to discuss the giant purple cray supercomputer. Now, if you're trying to keep a thing secret, maybe purchasing an incredibly large supercomputer isn't the best way of hiding that secret. People are going to notice that sort of thing, especially if you're the only company in the world that has one that's purple. Now, a crazy supercomputer is not exactly the thing you can just pop down to Dixon's and order. Normally, the process of buying a supercomputer takes years, and most of the organizations that buy them tend to be governmental and have long procurement chains to go through. Apple, on the other hand, may have broken the world's supercomputer purchasing speed record by turning it around in a few months. Apparently, with CEO John Scully being the person who phoned Cray's sales team and started the whole process rolling. Well, if you think they did quite well purchasing a supercomputer that fast, well, that's nothing to the speed of which they managed to get the damn thing installed. Now, if you think a Cray supercomputer is big, well, they're dwarfed in size by their own power and cooling supply systems, to the point where Apple had to dedicate and fit out a whole building on site just for the supercomputer. And they managed to turn this around in six weeks, which is an incredibly short time frame. And they did that by having free crews working in shifts who would work seven days a week and 24 hours a day. And they did it in six weeks. Now, renovating the entire building on campus in such a short time frame, with so much work having to be done, and then sticking a giant purple supercomputer in it, is the sort of thing that everyone on site notices. And this is also you can run your secret CPU project. So Apple was forced to come up with a cover story. And they said they bought the giant purple supercomputer and installed it at high speed so that they could do some interface work for the next generation of Macs. Now I'm hoping that's a story that almost no one on Apple's campus bought whatsoever. And if they did, hopefully they didn't work in the bridge purchasing department. Now there's a few other details about this Cray that are also quite interesting. You may be able to tell, I quite like Cray computers. Not only was it purple and installed and purchased in a record time, it also was the first one they shipped with a version of Unix on it. Prior to this machine, Cray machines have been all about running Fortran. In fact, that's basically all it did. It ran Fortran programs. It's just, it ran them very quickly because it made use of Cray's Fortran compiler. And that compiler would take code and optimize it for Cray's vector instructions. And this is where you essentially give one instruction and a whole bunch of data and it carries out that same instruction on all that data in parallel. That's how a Cray supercomputer got its speed, by parallel instructions. Well, vector instructions to be precise. Now, what Unix and the C compiler for this platform didn't do was make good use of vector instructions. So you may be wondering, why on earth did Apple choose to have Unix put on this thing? Well, the answer is, all their chip design tools were written for Unix. So they needed it to run Unix and run it quickly, and run Unix quickly it did not. In fact, the engineers discovered that the Sun machines that they had connected up to the Cray actually ran the chip design application about as quickly as the Cray did. And although a Sun workstation could be quite expensive, it wasn't $15 million expensive. Yeah, Apple paid $15 million for this Cray supercomputer, and if they were the Department of Defense or the Department of Energy, that would have been probably some quite wise spending. But to run a chip design application, yeah, not, not, not so much. I'm going to give Apple the benefit of the doubt and 
hope that they were thinking, well, for chip simulation, it'll be really good. It's just, by the looks of it, they never really got round to doing that part. In fact, this poor crane machine ended up spending most of its life being used as a system to help design cases for various Apple machines. A task that in no way you needed a crazy supercomputer to carry out. So with its collection of a Cray supercomputer, a number of Sun workstations, and a few apples, and of course a couple of fax machines, I mean it was the 1980s, Project Aquarius continued to come up with what's a quite sophisticated risk design. Now the reason we know a lot of details about what was a secret project, albeit a secret project with its own building and a giant purple supercomputer, is because of a leaked specification document. Well, leaked or it was put onto the internet archive many years later and no one cared. That specification document was for a CPU codenamed Scorpius, which was Aquarius' RISC CPU. And it is a very ambitious CPU. Because architecturally, this thing has what it refers to in the document as Independent Processing Unit, or PU Processing Unit, which is an idea we know today as cores. Yep, in the 1980s, Apple was working on or designing a multi-core RISC CPU. And I don't just mean that these things are a bit like modern cores. No, this really is exactly the same idea. Each processor core had 16 general purpose registers, the same number of general purpose registers ARM does. Each core also has 7 local registers, and there are 8 global registers that are shared by all the CPU cores. There are also instructions that allow these cores to talk to each other, and then there are other instructions that allow CPU packages to talk to each other. So you could have created a multiprocessor system with this as well. And these instructions are necessary so you get cache coherency across the system, because if you didn't have that, what ends up getting written back into main system memory would kind of depend on which core or processor wrote to memory last. As changes that have been written out by one CPU core to memory, might get completely dropped because the other CPU core doesn't have that change in its cache when it makes an update to memory. In fact, guaranteeing cache coherency is one of the main testing tasks that go on when modern CPU designs are being tested. The other feature they had in this specification was something that at this point we'd not seen inside microprocessors yet, although we had seen them in supercomputers. Although we probably shouldn't be too surprised about this because Sam Holland's background was in supercomputing. The processor was intended to feature single instruction, multiple data. These are these vector instructions we were talking about with the Cray earlier, and there's something we'd not see introduced into the world of PC processors, for example, until the Pentium MMX came out, and then much more usefully, the SSE extension. Oh, that's going to get me comments from the Intel fanboys, or they'll slightly preempt you and go, yeah, okay, the MMX was better than nothing just. All these features, if they'd actually got this chip out, would have put this CPU way ahead of its competitors, as it contains a lot of architectural features that are now standard in modern chips, but we wouldn't see for nearly 20 years. If nothing else, they did a pretty good job of predicting what the future of a CPU is going to be like. But as you're not all running apples based on the Scorpio CPU, you know the project didn't end well. One of the reasons all these computer companies have been able to create RISC processors and run them at pretty rapid clock speeds was the design's simplicity. Everyone else's designs were pretty simple from the first ever RISC processor up until the likes of Spark and Arm and MIPS. Scorpius was very far from simple. This is a really complicated design with cores sharing things like the memory management unit, cache, you got synchronization instructions, global registers. There's a lot going on in this chip, which means there is a lot to design. There is a lot to get wrong and then fix and then redesign. And all of this just burns through resource. Resource that Apple was maybe struggling a little bit with. In fact, Apple was about to go into a decade which would see it almost go bankrupt. But it seemed a big turning point for the project was when Sam Holland left Apple. And Apple brought in Al Alcorn to replace him. And yes, that is a name that will be familiar to some people who are watching this, and it is the same Al Alcorn who created Bong. But by this time in his career, he'd left Atari behind and become a fellow at Apple. So Al was put in charge of the project, and it must have felt a bit like being handed a poison chalice because you handed the project that people are beginning to think of as failed, the previous guy has left, and you don't really have anything to prove, so if it goes well, it's not exactly going to bolster your reputation so much because you're the dude who invented Pong. Now, it seems Alcorn's view was that despite the very, very bright people that he had working on this project, it was probably not something that he could rescue. But he did bring in Hugh Martin from Ridge Computers. Ridge Computers had created a very early 
32-bit RISC CPU. So bringing in someone who'd already successfully designed a RISC processor and got it into production and use would seem like a pretty good step for helping move everything along. But it would seem Martin's view of the project wasn't exactly positive, to the point where he apparently described the Scorpius's design to both Alcorn and John Scully as ridiculous, and suggested that maybe Apple should concentrate on its strengths, which at that point in time seemed to be creating ever more beige boxes, than try and compete with giants like Intel and Motorola. Now it seems whatever Martin said seemed to either chime with what both Scully and Alcorn also thought, or his opinion carried such great stock that they decided to cancel Project Aquarius. So this left Apple still in need of something to replace the Motorola 68000 as, well, their new processor had turned out to be a dead end. So Hugh Martin was put in charge of designing a Mac based around an existing RISC CPU, and the one he chose was Motorola's 88K. Yeah, you thought this was going to go power PC, but no, not yet. And this new machine was codenamed Jaguar. And like all pieces of electronic equipment codenamed Jaguar, you know it's going to be a failure. In fact, the Atari Jaguar is now considered the SI unit of failure. One of the problems with the CPU they chose, despite also coming from Motorola, it was in no way compatible with the 68000. No existing Mac application software would run on it, and the operating system wasn't going to either. So they'd have to come up with a whole new operating system for the Mac, which they started work on. It was codenamed Pink. However, a different group of Apple engineers decided that they would tackle creating an emulator for the new hardware that would run the old Mac OS and all its software. And it turns out that emulator was a lot faster than most existing Mac computers. But Apple decided in the end they weren't going to use the 88K. And as Motorola's only other customer for the 88K was Ford, and Ford then decided rapidly that they weren't going to use it, well, the 88K ceased to exist. Now at this point, Apple explored two other processor options for their machine, the ARM and the MIPS processors. Now at the time, Apple actually owned a share in ARM, and they really could have shortcutted quite a lot of their journey if they just jumped to ARM at this point, but no, that was not to be. And that's because IBM turned up. They'd heard Apple had tried porting their operating systems to Intel at one point, the Star Trek project, and wanted to know, would they port Mac OS to their new PowerPC 601, the same chip they'd been using in their RS6000 workstations. IBM even offered to help finish off this new pink code base, which was going to be the basis of the operating system, just as long as Apple would adopt PowerPC. And it seems that offer was very tempting to Apple because they took it and formed AIM, the group that contained Apple, IBM, Motorola. And as they say, the rest is history. So I'm going to briefly engage in the thing you probably shouldn't engage with, what ifs. If Apple had continued this project and actually managed to deliver it, we would have got what is essentially the common CPU design today more than a decade earlier than we did. And why, undoubtedly, it would have been regarded as a very, very good processor, it may also have been the thing that killed Apple at this point in time. The problem for Apple is they just about survived this period, I mean, really, by the skin of their teeth. The 90s was really not a good time to be Apple. I mean, PowerPC came out at just about the right time that they needed it. If it had been much later, that could have well been the end of the Mac line of computers. And the Scorpio CPU, while it may have been great, they couldn't have got that finished in the same time frame that they managed to get a PowerPC-based Mac out there. And also, the cost of R&D and taping out and manufacturing a CPU is huge. And Apple ate through all its capital reserves and then started selling off assets to keep itself afloat, starting at around this time. So if those assets and capital reserves had not been there because of the whole CPU designing thing, then Apple could have easily just tipped into oblivion. Now, admittedly, if they'd had a better CPU than PowerPC, they might have been there to sell a few more Macs as well. So we will never know how this would have worked out. But it's not as simple to say that if they'd finished this, there would have been a better Mac, and therefore Apple would have done much better. We don't know that. And the capital requirements to build that chip, well, that may have left Apple without the reserves to make it through their, let's say, basket case years. I'm not going to talk any more here about that period of Apple's history. In fact, one day I might well do a video on it, but that day is not today. Well, hopefully you've enjoyed today's video. And for some of you, it's answered that question of 
What was that weird gap in their history between the 68,000 and moving to PowerPC? Because there always seemed like there was something missing from that story. And it turns out there was. A secret project involving a purple cray supercomputer. As ever, if you've made it to this point, I'd like to say thank you very much for watching. And if you did enjoy the video, please use that thumbs up button that YouTube's created just explicitly for the purpose of indicating that. And if you'd like to help the channel out, why not hit the subscribe button? Because that makes YouTube actually tell people that this channel and its videos exist.